There are many businesses around the world that are extremely dependent on the weather. Now, the list is vast and long of this weather dependence, but include the leisure industry, uh, the supermarket retailer businesses, we've got energy consumers and producers, and even the agricultural business space. But primarily, it has been the energy industry that has uh, driven the demand for weather type products to actually hedge against this weather related risk. So in this video, we're going to go through a complete introduction of temperature options. And then in further videos, we're going to explain the process of doing data analysis and then option pricing of different weather derivatives. So it's estimated that nearly 30% of US economy is directly affected by weather. So weather derivatives are financial instruments that can be used to reduce the risk associated with these weather conditions. They can be things like temperature, rain, frost, and snow. So the first weather derivatives were actually traded over the counter in 1996 when Aquila Energy structured a dual commodity hedge for Consolidated Edison Co. These products have continued to trade OTC since 1997 and as the market grew, the CME introduced exchange traded weather futures and options from 1999. If you go to the CME's website, what you can see is that there are a total of nine US cities that actually have listed futures and options associated with them, and then three other cities outside of the US, namely Tokyo, Amsterdam, and London. Now to put that in perspective, the total percentage volume of traded weather derivatives on the CME exchange is as follows. You've got New York with the highest amount of volume followed by Dallas, Tokyo, Chicago. Now in weather derivatives, we have the terminology of degree days. So temperature data is readily available and obviously free of charge from many meteorological stations across the world. So the information is given in the form of a high and a low every day. So the high is the maximum temperature of the day and this we're gonna denote with T max for a particular day N. The min is a min temperature of the day and we've got T min N. The average temperature is gonna be denoted by just T N and this temperature is just going to be the weighted sum of both of these numbers. Although this is not the intuitive definition of what the average temperature is for a day, this is the standard that has been adopted to be able to describe heating degree days, HDDs, and cooling degree days, CDDs. So let's describe what heating degree days are and cooling degree days. Just as the name suggests, heating degree days are days that are required for heating. So what we're looking at is if the average temperature is below 65 degrees Fahrenheit, then how, mo how many degrees do we need to heat to get to 65? So therefore we take the maximum of zero or 65 minus this average temperature. Now cooling degree days are the opposite. Cooling degree days are required when the average temperature is above 65 degrees Fahrenheit and then the amount of degrees required to bring it down to 65 degrees. So it was the max of Tn minus 65 or zero. Now to see that in action, we're going to import NumPy, Pandas and Matplotlib. We're going to take the example where temperatures um, are normally distributed around 65 degrees Fahrenheit with a standard deviation of five. We're gonna take 92 days or a three month period. So we've got our heating degree days, which is the maximum of zero, 65 minus those temps, and then the cooling degree days, which is the maximum of zero or temps minus 65. So now I'm just placing that in the data frame and you can see the results here. Essentially when we have on the first day an average temperature of 55 degrees, this is below 65 degrees. So it's going to be a heating degree day. What is the heating degree day? Well, it's just the difference between 65 minus this 55, and we get 9.6, whereas it's zero for CDD, because the maximum is defined as the maximum of zero or the temperature average minus 65. So therefore we get zero. Same thing for a temperature below 65 degrees um, Fahrenheit, where we get here in this case, four when the average temperature is 60, and we get the opposite occurring when the average temperature is above 65 degrees or above that reference temperature threshold. So here we have a cooling degree day when we had uh, nearly 68 degree average temperature, we get a three degree CDD. And if the average temperature is 73, then we get an eight, uh, nearly eight degree 
CDD. Now, as you can see, I've then summed the 92 day period, the three month window, and then what we've ended up with is the total uh, heating degree days over that period, and then the total cooling degree days over that period. Now, let's talk about traded products. Essentially, the futures contracts on monthly cumulative degree days have been introduced on the CME, which, as I've just shown you, on their website. But traded volumes are quite small. So here you can see a graph from January 2019 through to the end of 2020. And here are the volumes that have been traded in both the options and the futures. And this is total across all locations. So relatively small. So we will be considering contracts that actually trade in the OTC market, which actually contributes for a very large uh, proportion of weather derivatives. These are styled to location and then also different contract features. We standardize our notation to refer to other reference temperatures instead of only 65 degrees Fahrenheit. For example, in Australia, we're using degrees Celsius and we have different base reference temperatures. For a particular day in a given period, we've got the HDD is the maximum of zero or the temperature ref minus the average, and a CDD is the maximum of zero or the average temperature minus that reference temperature. So a buyer of an option will receive the amount, the payoff of the payoff function F of a particular degree day, whether this is a heating degree season or a cooling degree season. So the payoff function F is computed on the cumulative index over a period, just like we did before, the sum over a particular period. For heating degree days, this uh, DD is going to be equal to H uh, subscript N, which is really our heating degree days summed over the entire period. Whereas cooling degree days, we're going to use uh, the degree days is equal to C subscript N, which is equal to the summation of all the cooling degree days for every day within that period. Now, the typical seasons that actually trade in OTC, uh, we've got cooling degree uh, day seasons, so CDD season between 15th of May and 15th of September, and the heating degree day seasons, HDD season, is from 15th of December through the 15th of March. Sometimes it starts in November. So now we're gonna talk about popular payoff functions that are used OTC. So we've got a call with a cap. So our payoff function is the minimum between our cap C and this uh, rate alpha multiplied by the difference between the heating degree days or the cooling degree days, the degree days minus some kind of strike. So we've got a uh, max between the degree days minus a strike, which is a number of degree days and zero. And then that's multiplied by this alpha, which is a payoff rate. So per degree day. Now with reference to statistical analysis of financial data in R, uh, Rene Camon's book, then the payoff rates for alpha are commonly used as 2,500 US dollars per degree day or $5,000 while the caps are actually common between half a million and $1 million US. So an example here would be where a cruise suffers from reduced summer sales when there are extreme hot weather. So to hedge risk, the company might buy out of the money call options on spring CDCs. So possibly with a cap because the business is only ever going to sell a minimum number of cruises no matter what. So here we're looking at the call option payoff. So on the left hand side, we've got the payoff uh, in US dollars with our total cap of $500,000. Here I've used alpha a rate of $5,000 per degree day. So as you can see, our strike for this call is 750 degree days. And then after each, each degree higher than that, it starts kicking up by $5,000 payout until the cap, which is $500,000. Now put with a floor works in a very similar way. So now we've got our payoff function, which is the minimum between the floor F and the alpha, our payoff rate, multiplied by the max of the strike minus the degree days and zero. So an example here might be to hedge risk um, that a warm winter decreases sale revenue for a particular gas or heating company, then they might choose to buy a put on HDDs over the winter season. 
the payoff diagram of the put looks like this with the maximum payoff up here at $1 million this, in this case, with again, I've used a alpha of $5,000 per degree day. So on this put, the strike is 550 and for every degree day lower than that, then the payoff increases by $5,000 up until this floor of $1 million. Now, the last example I'm going to explain here is a collar, and this is where we go long the call and short the put. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, essentially you can end up with a zero cost collar. So an example is to hedge revenues against a mild winter, a gas company could enter into a zero dollar collar contract, so no upfront cost, that pays the writer if the winter is cold, and this isn't a problem for the gas company because they've had a good season of revenue then, and it receives payment if the winter is warm. So this is really an insurance product that pays them if they don't have a good winter period in terms of revenue. So the way this looks then is we've got the exact same contract terms that we had for our call and our put example, um, and this time the collar is a function of those both. So we're short the put and we're long the call, and you end up with a collar in the red with those corresponding strikes there. This was just a brief introduction of how temperature options work. In the next videos, we're going to go through uh, temperature derivatives from top to bottom, and then more generally weather derivatives after that. So the first thing we're gonna look at is modeling daily average temperature. So we need to model seasonality. So we're going to have to detrend and then remove seasonality. Here we're going to be using two methods. So we've got the stats models, which is uh, using decompose function, which is a classical decomposition using moving averages. And the second method we're gonna do is actually detrending and then modeling the seasonal component as a Fourier series. Now we also need to model the temperature. So for modeling the temps, we're going to look at two different approaches. We're going to look at time series like the armor model. And then we're going to use a stochastic differential equation that we have looked at before, a mean reverting ornstein ulbach process. Now we also have to model temperature and volatility over time. So the dependence on seasonality is going to be very important here. For this, we're going to look at fitting Fourier series to model the volatility of temperature over time. We can look at parametric regression. So for example, polar Binomials. We're going to look at uh, local and non-parametric regression, so using splines to actually model this volatility. We're going to look at also incorporating piecewise non-constant functions that actually piece um, capturing volatility for each different season individually. Then we're gonna finally, once we incorporate all of that into actually pricing temperature options. So we can use the statistical analysis of the historical temperature data and models to price options. We're going to examine the actuarial approach that has been used historically, and this is called historical burn analysis. This is where you use all the historical data to then say, what would I have paid out in the past if I bought a similar option? Another approach is that many uh, academic articles have looked at actually an alternative Black-Scholes approach with um, ornstein ulbach dynamics. Now this is an approximation, but it has been successfully implemented in some seasons, and we'll get into that more later. Then we're going to look at the two most comprehensive approaches, which are both Monte Carlo simulations. One is where we are actually going to use our time series armor model that we've developed. And then we're going to use our risk neutral pricing dynamics of the Ernstein Erlbach model that we created to actually price a weather derivative as well. So hopefully you're looking forward to the next couple of videos. I think this is going to be an exciting series and really digging and diving deep into this topic.